Muted. Okay, hi everybody. My name is John Lincoln and welcome to Ignite Visibility's most important SEO initiatives of 2016. If you don't know that much about Ignite Visibility, we're a two and a half year old company and we focus mostly on SEO, social media, conversion rate optimization, and paid media. And today we're going to tell you about some of the most technical, interesting things that you're going to see going into search and the things that you need to be aware of going into the next year. So I am the CEO and I've been doing internet marketing for about 10 years now, worked on some huge clients. I've also been a teacher at UCSD for five years now on SEO, uh, analytics, pay-per-click, and conversion rate optimization. And I pretty much love this stuff and do it every single day. But I also have somebody else on the line um, who is our director of strategy. His name's Alan Bush, and I'm very excited to have him here as well. And the two of us are going to walk you through all of the most important SEO initiatives for next year. Alan, would you like to go ahead and say hello? Hello, everyone. My name is Alan Bush. I am the director of strategy and have eight years' experience in the internet marketing industry, over eight years, actually. And I also teach at UCSD as well, and have had two internet marketing-related podcasts that have, have gone international. Awesome. Thanks, Alan. So the two of us are going to walk you through the most important SEO items for 2016. But before we get into that, you know, I want to give you just a basic outline. So today we're talking about why SEO. We're going to talk about the history of SEO in 2015, because we can't know where we're going if we don't know where we've been. And then we're going to get into the most important items for 2016. So first things first, why SEO? Alan, why should people care about SEO? Why should they be investing in SEO? Well, statistically, it's just the right thing to do. And you can see from the, the webinar right now, 93% of online research begins with a search engine. And I've asked this question to the people in classes, and, and they always say, when they get online, they go to Google first. Google owns 70% of this market share. So basically, everyone opening their browsers go to Google, and then Google is the predominant search engine people utilize. Then at that point, 70% of the links users click on are organic. And by organic, we mean non-paid, things that are not ads. That takes up the majority of the space within the search engine when you're doing your searches. Right after that, 75% of users never scroll past the first page. So evidently, people are quick to just make decisions, and only 25% of users actually go through the second or third pages in the search engines. That's really good info there, Alan. And I, I think you and I, both doing this for such a, a large amount of time now, we can attest to the benefit of SEO. A lot of our clients, 50 to 70% of their online traffic comes from search engine optimization. We have clients that are making billions and millions of dollars through this marketing channel. Um, other ones who are just getting started, there's a lot of different phases in the life cycle of, of SEO. You know, and when it comes down to it, just so everybody knows, SEO is about 50% on-site optimization or what you do to your website and about 50% off-site optimization. And that's kind of what translates into your SEO rankings, right, where you actually end up in the organic, not the paid, the organic side of, of the search engine. So, and we'll get into that quite a bit more um, as we get into this webinar. But first, let's get warmed up. Let's try to kind of understand what happened in, in 2015 so that we know where we're going in 2016. So, Alan, what were some of the biggest updates that, that happened? The three biggest updates were related to the following. Mobile, we called it mobile getting, the mobile update. This is uh, April 22nd, 2015. Google pre-announced an algorithm update telling us that mobile rankings would differ from mobile-friendly websites. So basically, they gave more credibility if your site was responsive or mobile-friendly, for example. The next item was the quality update. This is a big, large-scale ranking change through their entire algorithm. It was called Phantom. It's going to scary some scary terms to give you. Google acknowledged that their core algorithm was updating and, and looking for different quality signals. So this may impact a lot of different types of searches, either good or bad. Also, Panda, for people who aren't aware, the first Panda iteration tackled content farms. And so basically, they focused heavily on quality content or whether or not you had quality content. 
And so that happened July 17th in 2015. Google announced was it's Google, uh, sorry, Panda 4.2 was most likely a Panda beta refresh, saying it could take months to fully roll out. So there's a very slow rollout of these updates. And bear in mind, websites that get these updates, they may not be penalized, but even backlinks linking to them might be penalized. So even if your site is not hit, then sites that were previously supporting you might have been hit. So this is what has been kind of changing the landscape of 2015. Great points. Yeah, these were three major updates. And what's interesting to me is it all came down to quality, quality, quality. Is your website mobile ready? If it's not, you lose your traffic. Do you have quiet, high quality backlinks? If you don't, you don't rank well. Are you creating high quality content? And, and you know, what was really interesting is, is Google kind of furthered that idea with, with a couple other initiatives as well. So one of them, was Google came out, and this guy Gary Eyes from Google, who is you know one of the new spokespeople who's taking the place of Matt Cutts, who used to be yeah. the main spokesperson. He came out and he said, if you're an SEO and you're recommending against going HTTPS, right, which means that your website's secure, and you're recommending against not going secure, then you're wrong and you should feel bad. Right, and that was a pretty <laughs> funny tweet that came it's out. Right, Alan. So, yeah. so exactly. yeah, and so. We've been pushing a lot of our clients into HTTPS. In fact, all of them, right? And that's going to be a major yeah. initiative. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of those things that it, it, it's worth doing. I mean, it takes a lot of resources, but once you do it, you're A, we've been seeing also a lot of like WordPress hacks and things that are going on with people's websites. So this will mitigate a lot of this, these problems. And also, technically speaking, Google gives you a boost for doing HTTPS. They do. Yeah, and you know what? We migrated Ignite visibility to HTTPS. It helped quite a bit with our national rankings. We've done it with a lot of clients. We've probably migrated 30 or 40 websites at this point, and every single one of them has seen not only a boost in rankings, but it also makes their customers um, feel a little bit better about the experience when they're using the site because they know it's secure. And then Another thing that came out is Google said that structured data might be a ranking factor moving forward. So structured data, in case you don't know, is a way to mark up elements in the code of your site to tell search engines um, what the page is about, what the website's about. And we're going to get into that quite a bit more. But just know that structured data is going to be a really important thing to focus on, not only for click-through rates when a rich snippet shows within a Google search result, but also potentially for rankings. Um, as we move forward. Also, applications became important. So this one is a little bit tricky in that basically it, it's kind of a tough concept to understand in some ways. But basically, Google made it so that if you have a uh, application and you map a URL on that application to a page on your mo on your website, then that page is going to rank higher and people can actually click on the URL and they can open it up in their application. So application SEO is a whole new thing. You can get apps to rank in, in Google and in other search engines. And if you do it correctly, you're going to rank higher there. So just kind of a cool, new, innovative thing um, that really you know anybody who has an app definitely has to take a look at. And Alan, that's an example of one right there. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, exactly, and that, and and that's another thing you just kind of mentioned that it, it, I encourage people that people who have apps to apply this because uh, it's really going to help you. And also, if you're thinking about making an app, this might be a good incentive to make that app because then you're going to get extra boosting within the rankings for people utilizing it. So um, yeah, this is a what, triple chocolate therapy cookies, <laughs> um, all the cooks uh, They have an app that basically. Uh, and if you, you notice also this schema involved in there as well, but uh, but they get boosting ranking with this app page, so they're actually occupying uh, the highest space in the in the search engines. Great, and then another really exciting thing that I think that we have to take a look at. So Moz, if you're not familiar with Moz, Moz is uh, a suite of tools, a, a bunch of really good ones, some that aren't so good, but generally, you know, a very <laughs> very well-known 
company in the industry and they came out and they did a survey with 150 experts and they asked them what are going to be the most important ranking factors to Google right within this this next year and they hadn't done one of these for two years so everybody was pretty excited about it a lot of people in the, the search engine optimization community got to get involved and they came out with these factors so the first one that they came out with was domain level link features right or the amount of links and the power of those links that are pointing at your domain right the next one was page level Level link features or the amount of links that are going to a specific URL that you're trying to get ranked in Google right so you actually have to have links to those individual URLs and then the third one was page level keyword and content based features so you know how good is the content on that page what's interesting is we've done quite a bit of analysis on this I think that this aligns pretty well um, Alan are you seeing those as still the biggest ranking factors Absolutely. This trend is very predominant in most websites. Now, I will say that there are exceptions when people have problematic issues with their, their website. you got to fix a few things. We're going to go over that in a little bit. But for the most part, have your content aligned and have your backlinks that come from really credible, relevant, powerful sources. That's the top three things, and I would totally agree with this uh, industry survey. It's really interesting that those are still the biggest, most important ranking factors. And you bring up a great point. Yeah. If your website's not technically correct and there's stuff that's broken, you can't rank, right? Yeah, I mean that's part of the problem is that a lot of these things will really augment a really great website, but if your your ducks aren't in a row, so to speak, um, these things are not going to be the priority. The priority is to fix your website, and then these things become the priority. These are the the gas that really makes your engine go higher. I think that's really interesting because Alan and I, being in this industry for a long time, often people come to Ignite Visibility for very, um, very technical, odd SEO issues where you're working with a new technology or even an older technology, and for some reason things aren't lining up correctly in order to get it indexed. And and one thing that that can really inhibit somebody's SEO progress is something breaking or something just not being set up technically correct. But with all things correct, all things right on the site, it definitely comes down to to links and page content. Um, now another thing just came out. Alan, tell us a little bit about Rank Brain. Well, oh, Rank Brain, this just came out like last month. So we're at the cutting edge of everything that's going on in the internet market industry. Uh, so basically, Rank Brain, in not so many words, is the artificial intelligence. It's their machine learning engine. Um, think Skynet. <laughs> Google's becoming Skynet at this point. Uh, but they're trying to incorporate what they've invested in their artificial intelligence research into their searches. So right now, we understood that this could be the third leading ranking factor in the, the series of ranking, ranking factors that go into Google's algorithm. There's hundreds. Um, with, there's about 200 signals. But this could be, which is speculated to be, the third most important one. And what they're trying to do is understand how you think when you do searches, when you're doing your queries, what your intent is. So this is going to be the future. People are going to do, search engines are going to try to understand your intention of why you're looking for what you're looking for, not just words. So it's important to understand that concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you explained that very well. You know, the only thing that I heard that that kind of surprised me is apparently they take this data from their search engines, they run it offline, and then they bring it back, and then they re-upload it to Google, and then they influence the future rankings based off of that. So it's actually kind of like an external program. We heard that directly from Google. But rank right now the third biggest ranking factor, um, very, very interesting stuff, and stuff that we knew was coming for a long time. Um, yeah, Vision, so, I think so was the update that did that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, was, yeah there was quite a update quite that originally had that. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, as we kind of go into 2016, now we want to talk about the items that we're recommending. And Alan and I first started talking quite a bit about being technically correct. You have to be technically correct, right? So our first thing is get your technical ducks in a row. You can't have a broken site and rank well. You can't have a site that's not optimized well from a structural perspective and do well in, in SEO. So first, go HTTPS, right? And I'll just tackle this one. Switch your website to HTTPS. You're going to rank better. Make sure all your internal links point to HTTPS. All your external links point 
um, to the correct version of your site. Make sure your images and fonts are secure. Put in 301 redirects from your old site to your new site. Set up your new site in Google Search Console. Make sure that you really do all these items in the correct method. Go HTTPS. Don't get locked. You know, don't get put behind the curve. You, you really have to do this. Um, what about going mobile? Mobile is super important because the web has gone increasingly to better and better placement devices that you have handheld devices. People are looking more and more on their phones, on their tablets, on their phablets, on their iPads, etc. Um, for website information and you need to be on that cutting edge. So make sure that your website uh, the top priority for me would be that your website is responsive. And that means that it responds and moves no matter what device you're on. If I'm on a Samsung, it will, it will be uh, appropriate for my phone. And I can click on things that are most important. Um, and if you're not mobile friendly, not only did we mention this previously, that you will not get the credit that you, you should have, but also you may lose customers based on the mobile experience because people are not privy to that pinch and grab method anymore. They just want to click the buttons right there in front of them. So having a website that's responsive is probably my top recommendation in response to the mobile. Now you should also shoot for your page speed to be pretty um, low because you're, you're, they'll give you scores and Google actually has a tool that allows you to, to test your scores. It's page speed insights. gives you desktop and mobile speed rankings. Now speed is a lot more important than mobile because it renders things a little bit slower than a desktop. But there's a lot more importance placed on that because you have fast loading times in mobile. That's people are you know they have a short attention span, so you want to capture them immediately. So shoot for mobile page speed scores with 65 or higher, somewhere in the uh, yellow and green range when you see the page speed insights tool, and then uh, make sure that everything you map your mobile application URLs to the corresponding web page and set up a Google Search Console account. And then uh, you can also integrate with Google Now. There's a lot of technical things that go into that. But basically, you want to make sure that you are tapped into the mobile market. Again, going responsive is probably my top priority there. I, rec I totally agree with that. I mean, anybody who's responsive has a better foot forward than somebody who's on a subdomain or using the other method called very HTTP header, which never really works that well. So absolutely good page speed, good mobile usability. Um, now, another thing came out that I thought was really interesting. So this one's really highly technical, but a lot of websites are built on AJAX or JavaScript, right? There are two different ways to, to, to build a site and, and to build functionality on a website. But Google came out and they said that there's no more optimization um, for something called escape fragment. And it used to be a way to tell Google, hey, this is another web page that you should go to and you should use the data on this web page to rank the web page that's an AJAX and JavaScript. So all you really need to know is that the escape fragment optimization is gone, right? So you, you'd not, you cannot do that anymore. But what you need to do now is you have to make sure that you have a really good HTML base, right? So all the normal SEO principles that, that apply to a normal web page also need to apply to an, to an AJAX page, right? So you need to make sure you have the right H1, H2, um, copy, optimized images, um, and things like that. Also, schema.org, we saw that schema was going to be, you know, just critical, right? And, and it has been critical in order to get more click-through rates. On this slide, you can see an example of rich snippets uh, that's being created by the schema.org uh, for these individual events. And we want to continue to put more and more schema on individual sites, and we want to have a specific schema strategy for each website, right? And you, so re really people need to do this. Alan, what are your favorite types of schema? Um, I personally like the logo, product, and reviews schema. I see, see those more prevalent in searches that I personally do. Um, things like recipes as well also pops up. But the reviews, the product, event is a really other really good one, um, if it's, if particularly for certain websites that actually hold events. Local is probably the most important one for any company that has a brick and mortar store. So uh, again, it varies from client to client, but appropriately enough, I believe local would help you out tremendously in terms of your uh, brick and mortar locations. And then if you have extracurricular things like videos and that type of things, then these things become more prevalent and you can do a video schema as well and it will give you rich um, search engine results, pages, 
when you're doing your searches. Um, breadcrumb schema is probably best for e-commerce related websites. I find that more useful for those because it, generally you want to find the path going back there and these things will pop up in the search results as well. So all these things are really important uh, but again I encounter them depending on client to client. Uh, like I said personally I've discovered that the local one probably helps the most in terms of um, getting that credibility on your mobile devices. That's great. And there's so many types of schema. You can say the type of website that, you know, your 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 website URL with schema.org. You can tell Google what your social media profiles are with schema.org. Um, really the list goes on. You can get as crazy as you want or as basic as you want. And, um, so I think that's important. Now this next slide talks about sitemaps. And this this one kind of came from me, um, you know, and I'll tell you why. Because one of the things that we see so often is people have no idea what types of sitemaps that they can have and that they can submit to Google Search Console. So for me, I think it's critical that every site at least have the ones in green, an XML, a video, and an image sitemap, as well as an HTML sitemap. Now take that HTML sitemap, create it, and link to it in your footer. Now the reason that we do that is because then Google can crawl the site, get into the HTML sitemap, right, because the only way Google crawls things is through hyperlinks, get into the HTML sitemap, and then see every page on your site internally linked um, by that HTML sitemap. Also, news in RSS feed sitemaps are great, um, especially if you're trying to get your content indexed quickly. Now, we have some clients, and they have people who scrape their website, and they'll, they'll scrape their website, they'll get their content indexed before the client even gets the site indexed, uh, the, the, the page yeah. indexed, right? So, so the RSS and the news helps quite a bit with that. So now we're talking about going local like a pro. Now, that's our second most important item. Now, Alan talked about that a little bit already. Um, but when it comes to local, Alan, what are you looking at? Yeah, the, if you look to the right, this is the client that actually we've used. And then basically they occupy like 90% of the local results here. So it's important to get these things in line. We have the local schema.org. We just discussed local. Make sure that your site is responsive. Of course, that would be a really great part of it as well. But also create profiles in Google Plus, the most important part of that, Bing, Yelp, and when possible use an external service that will help you get your look, uh, basically your NAP listings, your name, address, phone number, congruent with all the locations that are, are showing your address. And this will also help your rankings in local as well. And you can use things like Yext or Moz Local. Uh, both are great services and they do a fine job of making sure that your NAP listings are are aligned in all the um, directories. And that's really ideal. Mission Federal Credit Union ranking for one, two, three, four positions. And, and that's what yeah. we want to do for all our clients. Local is one of our uh, expertise here at Ignite. We've also got another client example right here who has climbed significantly from the local work up to over 3,000 extra visitors just for their, their local pages, which is, is great to see. So go local, do it in the right way, be technically correct with your location schema.org, optimized URLs, integrating your Google Plus page, and all that good stuff. Now our third item is to go multilingual and to enter new markets. Multilingual, multilingual uh, and multi-regional SEO is just so much fun. And I yeah. love that you can just translate a website into a different language and rank in all new countries and all new different language versions of Google, right? Yeah, it's, that's amazing. It's, I love this part of it too because you know, people probably hadn't thought about this. And one of the things, when I asked, when I teach the class, I, we talk to a lot of people who are international students. And even some people like in the UK, for example, they're speaking English, but it's a slightly different type of English. So you could do a UK translated, quote unquote, version of your website by, and then target the UK specifically. So even if you don't have the, the ability to translate into every single language, if you mastered English in some level and then you have someone that lives in England that can help you out, you can do things like this and, and have your website promoted towards these country specific things, like you said, regional optimization and, and as well as the language itself. It's awesome. And it's actually not too hard to do technically. Just make sure that you get your reflang tags and your X default tag correct. We have a lot of people who come to us here because they need help 
translating the pages, setting them up correctly, mapping everything together with the right reflang tags, but it's really not all that hard. Um, we do international optimization on some level or multi multilingual optimization um, for almost every client here just because there's so many benefits. Um, here's an example of one of our clients, an increase uh, in new users of 8,542%, an increase in goal completions of 5,284% because we push them into 25 new countries and languages. And, you know, that's what makes us feel good here is to be able to do that for a client. And honestly, it's just a matter of translating the pages, getting them optimized correctly, getting them indexed by Google. Um, you know, what I will say, there's a couple things you need to know before making the jump. Going international online um, comes with a couple challenges, right? Do you have somebody on the ground? Can you ship there if you're e-commerce? Um, you know, do you have support in those different uh, languages and in, in, in those regions? So I recommend everybody watch this video um, when you get a chance before you make the jump just to make sure that, that you're doing it correctly. So, Alan, what's our fourth thing? Build out your hubs of content. This is pretty important because you want to make sure that you're reinforcing your primary keywords or your primary statements with other types of content. So, not only should you optimize your web pages, but you should think about building subcategories. You should think about making sure that you have products and services that correlate with the main idea. Videos on the topic. Make sure your products are all there, of course. And then different types of pagination may help. So there's so many different variables. And not only just videos, but you can do other uh, type of blogs, infographics. There's new things called gifographics we were just talking about fairly recently um, that you can disseminate and have them focus surrounding your central ideas. And this will help you get rankings. It, it's one of those key ingredients to SEO. Build content that not only just copy, but other types of content that support this copy. And so and you can also put it on different pages of your website and making sure you're linking to them. And res they're, they're your own resources that you should be linking to. This is pretty important. Yeah, and all of this came from a lot of research that we did here at the company. So if you see the pages that are ranking the best online, they're the ones that have either a lot of external links going to them or they've put in a tremendous amount of effort building out hubs of content. And when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, right? Because if you do a, a broad query, right, Google wants to respond something that relates to every single different I intent that the user might have for that query, right? So it's a really good idea to make sure that you've got a diversity, uh, a diversified set of, of information to respond to that query, and Google ranks it higher. So our fourth item is to build an external linking strategy in brand around expertise. And, and when you think about it, that's kind of what we're doing right now, right? You've got Alan yeah. and I talking to you about <laughs> you know, what we're experts at, trying to help you, and trying to you know, help promote what we love to do. So there's a lot of different ways to do this, um, and it's a lot of fun. It's one thing that I've spent, oh, maybe the last six or seven years doing, but you know, just by creating somebody who's a figurehead um, of your company. And you know, one thing I will say, it's a lot harder actually to create somebody in, into an influencer than to actually get an influencer and align with them. So keep that in mind. To make an influencer can be hard because if you're doing it just by the blog, it could take years and years. But basically, this person needs to write for publications, give everything away in your blog, right? You want to do social media and uh, make sure that you're um, building out personal profiles, running ads, growing communities around these people, making this person the center of your inbound strategy so that there's a life and there's a face to your website online, right? Um, having them send out a, an email directly from them, a personal email, right? And that's one thing that, that we've done quite a bit here at Ignite. We have over 4,000 subscribers now. And then, you know, using some of these cool tools, and, and Alan, you're an expert on some of these tools. What, how do you like to use them? Yeah, a lot of things with backlinks, and uh, you can reverse engineer by seeing other competitors, what they're doing, and looking at their backlink strategy, who's linking to them, who are the people that are talking about them online. So the tools that I use are SEM Rush, um, Majestic SEO for backlinking, but Sumo is probably my by far my most favorite tool of the most of the last five years because uh, this does a really great job of pulling out 
articles that might be talking about your subject matter, and also a breakdown of influencers that people that actually can retweet. They have a retweet ratio depending on how many people are talking about that and what the likelihood is of them sharing content or at least responding to you or talking to them. So this is a really a great tool for people that are looking to do outreach and, and engage with influencers and in their industry. Highly recommend that you get on BuzzSumo. I'm a big fan. And I, I'll tell you, Alan turned me on to BuzzSumo maybe a year or two ago. And, and outside of all that cool stuff that you just said, Alan, well, the other thing I really like too is just being able to find a piece of content that relates to a query or relates to a term find out exactly who shared it, who was the most important person who shared it, and reverse engineer yeah. that exact strategy, create another piece of content that's just like it, and then use that to use that same strategy to promote that piece of content for a client. It's been such a cool service. So reverse yeah. engineering with BuzzSumo, very cool. Absolutely. And we've got a couple other SEO tools here that we really like. Um, you know, Hootsuite, great way to schedule out social posts, and you could even feed your blog directly to um, to these individual social sites. BuzzSumo we talked about, definitely check that out. Screaming Frog, if you're an SEO and you're not using Screaming Frog, then you're probably not a very good one. Uh, you got to check it out. It's a, it's a great, great tool. I mean, it's going to change your life, so make sure you download it. It's free, it. too. That's uh, the other thing. It's a free tool to take advantage. It is free, yeah, and it's just great data. Um, advanced web rankings, great way to check local and national rankings. Follower wonk, um, new one from Moz, great way to find Twitter influencers, demographic data. Um, walk us through the rest, Alan. Yeah, Open Site Explorer, broken link checker. If you want to know what's going on with your website's uh, backlink strategy, uh, Open Site Explorer is a great way to do this. this is uh, by Moz, I believe, and they have some great set of tools that, in general. But this is one of my favorites on there. Um, Majestic SEO, again, viewing your backlinks. I also have another one to add to this list would be Ahrefs. Um, two of my favorite tools to utilize when I'm looking at backlinks. Uh, really helps to understand where a client's coming from, when they come, especially when they come aboard, what they've obtained up to the point where we're working with them, and to know who's linking to them. Also to view competitors. You can look at competitors this way as well. Um, know them, really great for establishing social media profiles. I mean, they get that you can secure 300 different social media profiles. I mean, there's so many out there, and if they're specific to your niche, then it's really good to know that, you, hey, I mean, I hadn't thought about Tumblr, for example, and I have my name, my brand can be in Tumblr. Why not get a, just at least secure that social media profile for later use? Another favorite of mine is the uh, Link Detox tool. It's actually from Link Research Tools. This is a paid tool, but if you have bad links, and you can get penalized for having bad links. Link Detox breaks it down in such a nice manner where they analyze your whole backlink strategy, tell you what the good ones are, what the medium risk ones are, and where your high risk ones are. And the high risk ones are the ones that are considered toxic. And so this tool allows you to detox, quote unquote, your website and hone in on those where areas that are going to potentially cause you trouble later. We do this with people that have penalties, but also it's a proactive approach. So we can actually hone in on these areas before they become problems. The next tool is pretty much a standard in the industry. Google Search Console used to be called Google Webmaster Tools. It's, I still call it Google Webmaster Tools, uh, but the Search Console is something you have to have because it's Google telling you what's wrong with your website. So no other reason than that, you should be listening to the big G because they're the ones that are ahead of the game, as we said earlier. <laughs> and then there's other tool analysis tools like SEM Russian SpyFu. SpyFu is my one of my favorites because it analyzes competitors and actually gives you an overlap between your competitors and where you might be lacking. So if you want to know about keyword rankings, if you want to know about the traffic that originates from there, both SEMrush and SpyFu can give you some really great analysis. Great, awesome, thanks. And if you guys want to see more, you know, just go ahead and Google top 80 um, SEO tools, um, and you're going to find a post that that I wrote on Marketing Land. There's there's 80 of the best ones there. Al and I refer to that list quite often. Um, in the UCSD SEO class that we teach, as well as the UCSD um, analytics course that we teach as well, which Alan has been teaching a lot more than me recently because I've got a big <laughs> away. 
But. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it for us today, everyone. Um, you know, if you'd like to follow us on Twitter, I'm at Johnny Lincoln. We've got at Alan H. Bush. We've got a, at Ignite V. And please check out our Ignite Visibility University blog. Um, we are publishing the latest and greatest information from our company there quite frequently. Uh, it was a pleasure to be able to give you this information. And good luck to all of you uh, in your SEO in 2016. If you have questions, please let us know. Alan, anything you want to end with? That's it. Thanks, guys, for attending. And um, again, 2016, let's look forward to the great SEO experience. Perfect. Have a great day.